thanks for coming out. Uh, hopefully, I'll uh, teach you the many awesomeness ways of getting out. Okay. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm from the Oregon State University Open Source Lab down in Dallas, Oregon. Uh, we provide a lot of server hosting for open source projects, people like the Linux Foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, Google, you know, those types of folks. We provide a variety of hosting. Um, we also do some development on some projects. Um, I'm a Jinja developer. This will be my 10th year, actually, but I don't do a lot with them. <laughs> I'm a sysadmin by trade, but right now I'm the director of the lab. And uh, we manage about, I have uh, uh, three full-time employees and uh, about 18 undergraduate students that work for me at the lab. Um, a first, a disclaimer, these are based on my observations, my opinions. I have no like scientific, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, methodology on how I figured all this out. So I just wanted to say that at the very beginning. So feel free to, to troll me or whatever, but do it nicely um, if, you, if you believe. I, I may not know everything about all the other platforms, but it's based on my, my observation. And I might be a little bit biased on the Gennady side, but I'll just mention that. Um, so here's what I'll cover. I'll cover four of the major infrastructure and service platforms. Um, I'll discuss their various components from a CISMM point of view. Uh, kind of discuss how, what I think their strengths and weaknesses are when I took a look at them. Um, and kind of suggest like the best uses for each of these platforms because each of them kind of fit a better use depending on what you're doing. But I won't cover any platform or as a service or service as a service. Um, and kind of my background experience. So. Many, many years ago at the lab, we had a Zen cluster um, that was all Linux-based with a Linux iSCSI target server, which worked fine, but it didn't scale. Um, we didn't have any good management with it, um, and it just sucked. Not because it was Zen, it was just because of how we had it managed. Um, when we researched for an alternative tool at the time, this was back in about, uh, I think it was three years ago. Um, I think it's actually more than that. Um, and actually, one of my students had went on an internship with Google that summer. He came back and said, hey, I was working on this awesome tool. Um, you know, you should check it out. It's called Gennady. And so I spent about two months researching it, playing around with it, and finally decided to pick it. So three years later, four years later, um, we've been using Gennady with KVM, but it's been rock solid. Um, we haven't had any major issues with it. It fits well with what we're doing and the scale we're at. Um, in the end, we created a web front end for Gennady, which I'll talk about later. Um, they kind of help with it because it's primarily command line driven. And, and we're looking at ways of augmenting what Gennady does um, with other types of services um, because by itself it's not like the other platforms which I'll kind of talk about. So that kind of gives you a little bit of background on how I came to Gennady in different ways. Um, so kind of what's going on with infrastructure as a service. You know, there's way too many options out there, um, um, which is good actually because you have a lot of variation in what you actually want to do. Um, you know, if AWS API support is important to you, some of them do better, some of them don't do it at all, some do it their own way. Uh, the majority of the projects vary quite a bit. Um, some of the projects are rather have been around, around for quite a while, while others are fairly new, or maybe there's some kind of, they're in flux with the community of it. Um, each of them kind of solve different problems. Um, so depending on what you're wanting to do, um, some may work better than the other. And the complexity of each of the platforms kind of vary quite a bit too. Um, being a sysadmin, I like things simple. And I like things that work and not break and not have any too many things that can break. Um, and a lot of them have major differences in how the backend architecture kind of ties together, so I'll try and kind of cover that. Um, so what do I mean, or what, what do you really want to infrastructure service? Well, that's, that's kind of what matters and what we, how you want to pick. Um, you know, how easy is it to use? Um, it's fault tolerance built in, inherently into the design of it, or do you have to do that with the hardware you purchase? Um, so there's obviously costs associated with that. Um, you know, do you want to only use cheap hardware, or do you want to buy expensive hardware to make it even more redundant? Um, is performance an issue? Because some of these, the way they have things designed, might be better or worse with performance, depending on what kind of performance you're trying to aim for. Um, if you want to expand easily, um, some do it work uh, better or worse. Um, if you need to have some kind of API provisioning, so you want to write your own scripts to kind of get things going, some. Um, obviously, if they use AWS, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. They have their own uh, specific API or no API. Generally, they all kind of have API. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other factors that can kind of go along with this. But here's kind of a good list that I kind of thought of when I was thinking about, well, if I wanted to make this decision again today, what would I think about? Um, so for me, like, fault tolerance and low cost of entry was kind of important for me. I, I don't have a lot of money to buy expensive SANs. I, I have a lot of servers that I can use a little storage, and that's kind of what I was limited to at the time. Um, 
Now, infrastructure service generally has the same types of components. Um, storage kind of being the most hard part to kind of do, really. Um, but storage for me is like one of the biggest things that I prefer something that I look at. How does it do storage? How does the VM image work? You know, um, with the way EC2 is set up, you know, VMs are kind of, they can go up, they can go down, they can, you know, go away. Or is it, it's kind of the whole mentality of, do you treat your VMs as servers or as, or as, a, as cattle or as pets? You know, if they're cattle, then they can go away at any time. Um, and you can bring them back up, or are they more like pets where you, you nurture them and you keep them going. So it kind of depends on how you run your infrastructure. Um, really, the cloud methodology is going the way of the cattle, but things can go away um, and you have persistent storage. Um, generally, you have some kind of a virtual machine image management part and the infrastructure as a service. Um, you hope it has some kind of self-service, but um, it depends on what you want out of that. Um, self-service meaning, you know, the average user can log into a site deploy things really quickly, um, and they don't need much intervention from SISM and other people. Um, very, there's a lot of varying differences in how networking is deployed in a lot of these. Some of these are fairly flat, others have a lot of private networking that you can do. You can actually make switches out of it. Um, you know, it can get really complicated really quickly. Um, but yeah, you know, you, you can have user management. Um, the installation is kind of a major thing for me, being a SISM by trade. I care how easy it is to install and maintenance, maintain a, uh, an infrastructure. Um, so yeah, these are just some of them, not all of them, but kind of the ones I think about. Um, these are the four platforms I'm going to be comparing today. Um, uh, we can look at this CloudStack, uh, OpenStack, and Gennetti, obviously. Um, so there's others out there, but I thought these are kind of the four to kind of take a look at. Um, some history on each of these. So. Uh, OpenStack started as a project at NASA, um, and then it, uh, Rackspace kind of got involved and decided to make a big open social project out of it. So it launched essentially as a community in 2010. Um, and really, uh, it, it, it wanted to create all the various components that you would ever need to create a cloud. Um, and it's really an effort with multiple corporations involved in it at the same time. Um, it's really quite amazing seeing how it works. but. The thing that just boggles my mind is all the various components of this thing. Um, and you don't need all of these. You can only, you only need, you can only, uh, you know, maybe you only need to compute and um, the object store or some, some of the various components. That's the nice thing about OpenStack. You only pick and choose with what you need. But it's designed to scale massively. Um, so. What is the difference between Swift and Lance in this? Um, I'm not. Yeah. So Swift is object storage, things like S3, whereas Glance is image storage, so you take an image of your machine and store it within Glance, and then you can use that image to deploy on your machine, whereas Swift is more about the little pieces of files you put up and can access over the CDN or other things like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Glance can actually be built on Swift. It's really managing the images that you can spin up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so these have grown over time. I know when it first started, I think it was only these top three when it first started and launched. And then they added the GUI and the networking um, and so forth. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's it has a lot of components to it. Um, what's, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, it's perfect. Um, if, if you only need like a simple solution, this may not be what you want, um, kind of a thing. Uh, moving on to Eucalyptus, um, it's kind of been around for quite a while. Um, uh, but really it started as a research project at UC Santa Barbara. Um, they created a company in 2009, commercialized it, and then they initially split it up into two editions where there was open core, and then there was open source. We all know how that story goes with whenever you do open core, it doesn't go really well. Um, but uh, back in uh, June 2012, they finally went back to fully open source. Um, so they've kind of had some flux in that capacity, but they have a lot of uh, users that really like what they do. Um, there's various components that are kind of set up in a similar way, so they have uh, a cloud controller that manages um, all the resources, provides the web interface. They have an S3 type storage, kind of like uh, uh, Swift is, but called Walrus. Um, then they have, you know, the custom controller that kind of executes the VMs and the networking. Um, the storage controller to deal with all the, the block devices, so that's like EBS volumes on on uh, EC2, this is a kind of a similar approach. And one thing about Eucalyptus is it's kind of an aim to dive into the hybrid cloud mentality. 
So if you want to start out with a private cloud, you do it in Eucalyptus. It's somewhat compatible with EC2 and AWS, so you can move it on to AWS when you're ready for it. That's kind of really what they are trying to do. Um, and that's kind of the field they're getting into. Um, and, I, and I do know, uh, back in the day, especially when I, I used to hang out with some Canonical guys, and Canonical was really big on Eucalyptus a couple of years ago, and I can remember their rage phase of trying to install Eucalyptus. It was a pain in the rear um, to install it. Um, I know what I did, uh, I looked at it, I think it was last year, they improved that quite a bit. Um, they have like an actual uh, installation guide and script that kind of does it all for you. So it's gotten better. So if, you, if you've looked at Eucalyptus in the past, remember how much of a pain it was to install, they fixed that. Um, CloudStack, so that was originally uh, developed by cloud.com. Um, they opened sourced it in May 2010. Um, Citrix purchased it um, in 2011, and then last year um, they donated it to the Apache Software Foundation. So now it's Apache CloudStack, I think is what it's called. Yes. Um, so they're a part of the Apache ecosystem. Um, and I think they are no longer in the incubator, right? They graduated in March. Yeah. yeah, so that was a fairly recent, recent change. So congrats to them, that's awesome. Um, and so they kind of have it split up into various roles. Um, you have a management server, hypervisor nodes, and storage nodes. Um, and then you can have various layers, and it's kind of intended for, um, you know, you have a machine room over here, you have a machine room over here, and then inside of the machine room you have a rack or a row of racks, and maybe inside of a rack you have a group of machines. And so you can kind of layer your, your cluster as you want pretty easily with it. Um, and you can deal with different kinds of storage topologies too with it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a quick overview of CloudStack. Um, Gennetti was a project started by Google. Um, they had used it internally for many years. They open sourced it in 2007. Uh, they primarily used it for their back office and for operations. It's not their compute engine that they have now that you can, their public cloud service is not based on Gennetti. Um, but they use it for things like we have a rack full of servers. We need to run services like DNS and stuff like that at all the remote offices. Um, we need a system to do that. But its primary focus was on hardware for fault tolerance. Um, so if one of the machines goes down, we want to be able to spin up uh, and fix the VMs that are on it fairly quickly and easily, um, and so forth. It's primarily driven by using local block level storage, which is completely different than a lot of these other um, systems. Most of these other <coughs> cloud platforms use disk images. So you have some kind of a disk image hosted in your NFS or some other kind of service, um, and then your, your disk topology is inside of that disk image, which it has benefits. You can save a lot of disk space doing it that way, but you have a performance thing too. Um, and the reason why they use block level is because uh, they can do some data replication with that. Um, and really it was intended to deal with cheap commodity hardware. Um, it's kind of a similar concept with um, Luster FS in a way, where you have a bunch of nodes and you don't, maybe you don't care about the RAID, it has RAID or not, um, you kind of can do that with how you set up the VMs and so forth. But we don't do it that way, the levy, at, you know, all the layers of redundancy we can. Um, it's set up into various daemons. Um, these are all Python daemons, basically. Um, so you have the master daemon, which controls the overall cluster operation. Um, uh, so you have one, and the, the master daemon can, can run, uh, can change to node to node. So, if you need to take the master node down, you can move it to another node. Um, the node daemon basically controls the CPU, allocating storage, setting up the VM, starting VM, stopping VMs. And then they have a configuration daemon which con that copies the configuration to all of the various nodes. Um, uh, all the configuration is actually in a JSON file. It's kind of fun. Um, so, uh, but that's kind of what that's for. And then there's an API daemon that runs on the master node. Uh, so if you want to send remote calls to Gennetti, you can do that. And then they have another part called HTools. That's actually tools written in Haskell, of all things. But it deals with automatic allocation, so figuring out where should I put this VM, where should I put my secondary storage, and so forth, inside of the virtual machine. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the quick overview of the four. I know I didn't go into much detail. Um, that would take too long for me to do but I kind of wanted to give you an idea of like how the various components fit together. I'll go into more detail on how they differ here in a little bit. Um, before that, I kind of want to dive into um, <coughs> some more stuff about Gennetti. So Gennetti by itself isn't really a true cloud. Um, I'll, I'll say that right out. Um, it doesn't have self-service. 
uh, by itself. It doesn't have like a VMS service by default. Um, but you can do third-party add-ons to kind of achieve a lot of that functionality, which I think a lot of people, even if you've heard of Gennady, may not know about. Um, and so one of the first ones is actually um, Gennady Web Manager, which is the project that we created. It's basically just a Django front end to Gennady. And it's intended more for the admins, um, some users, some more advanced users. It's not really meant to be like the average Joe on the street can you know, spin up VMs and understand it, because it basically has all the various options you ever need. We haven't really tied down the, the, uh, <coughs> the interface for it. But you can do permissions, you can do groups, because Gennady by itself doesn't have that concept. Um, and uh, I kind of view it as the user interface in front of Gennady. Um, Synetho is actually another project we don't do. Um, it's actually a group in Greece that run this. Um, and basically, they took uh, Gennady and turned it into a cloud service. So they put a, got a bunch of components, put it together, and they turned it into like an OpenStack cloud, basically. Um, I'll show a diagram in here in a little bit. But they have an API that actually talks, I think, in AWS. has a pretty decent UI. Um, and they have a lot of varying uh, storage backends. So by default, Gennady uses DRBD, uh, which is, you can think of it as RAID 1 over the network, two block devices on two servers, and it replicates the data between the two. It's a poor man's sand in a way. Um, but what they really added was RBD, which is kind of in the Ceph Rados file system realm. So they can do a lot of fun stuff with, uh, you know, the duplication of, of, uh, of data and, and, and so forth. I'm not a really well versed in RBD, RBD but I know that they've had a lot of success with it. The main difference I saw between RBD and Ceph is that with Ceph you can actually have multiple uh, master controllers of where the files mm -hmm. are stored, so you actually have redundancy of locating the files. Yeah. Of course, most of the other systems I looked at, there was always a single point of failure somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think they actually used the set files with them. They just used the yeah, storage itself. back in from it. Yeah. For, uh, like S2 and S3. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's that's how they have that set up. I saw a presentation at Boston. Uh, early this year that they, they gave, and it was really interesting. I, I haven't taken a full look at Cisco yet, but it looks really interesting. Um, as far as Gennady goes, uh, like I said, it's probably primarily targeted for events. It's still, we haven't made a 1.0 release yet because we still need to add more features. Um, you know, we, we primarily write it with our undergraduate students, which don't have a lot of time on their hands. It takes a lot of time. Um, but it gives users simple console access to do the basic things that you need on a cluster. So you don't need to have command line access to do stuff with Gennady. Um, and I said, my mainly open source lab, us are doing it. Um, we just got accepted in the Google Summer of Code program this year. Um, so we're in the process of getting proposals in and we've gotten at least two proposals in. One of them for adding uh, some uh, visualization to the Gennady cluster so we can, you can go to a page hopefully and say, here's what your Gennady cluster looks like and here's how your VMs are all connected. And, Here's how all well the resources look. Because right now we don't really have a nice little visualization thing for that. And I also have another proposal for adding Vagrant support for Gennady. So say for example, if you don't want to run all your Vagrant VMs and VirtualBox on your VM, you want to you have a Gennady cluster running somewhere. So using Vagrant from the command line, talking to Gennady to do your stuff remotely. A lot of projects that we had. So that's another one that we have in there. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so here's a view of what Gennady Web Manager looks like really well on the screen there. Uh, but this is actually connected to the VNC terminal on the uh, the VM. It's using no VNC, which is another open source project that someone else uh, is working on. But it uses, it's HTML5 based, so it's not Java. It's awesome. Um, it uses, it, it's actually doing VNC over WebSockets. And so in the back end, we actually have a VNC proxy that talks WebSockets on the front end, and then in the back end it talks to the actual VNC. And we have the VNC ports on a private network so that the proxy is just in the front end. So that's what we have set up. So it's, it's a pretty neat setup that we have. And it sets up like a one-time password, but lasts, I think, 60 seconds to connect. Um, and it works really well for us. But that's kind of a really cool little overview of what it looks like. Um, when you look at a detail of a specific VM, unfortunately it cut off a little bit. But you can see there's a bunch of details, and then below here you kind of show all your various settings for KVM. Um, this is obviously a very, very detailed overview of what it looks like. Um, so yeah. 
I see it has the change in, or are there users and permissions to the, at the VM level or at the admin console level there? Uh, for Gateway Web Manager? Yeah. So we have uh, a lot of varying permissions with the model. So we have uh, permissions on the cluster, permissions on the, uh, and on the virtual machine. So we can give users just access to the console and power, but they can't create VMs, they can't delete VMs, they can't, um, uh, like, uh, I think, uh, edit the VMs and so forth. Um, I'm trying to remember all the various permission levels. Um, but yeah, we have a very, very good permission level system. So we have another permission level where you can create a set, you can have a group, and you can have group amends, and, and the group amends can add users to the group, and then the, those users can have access to any VMs that um, are owned by that. We also have a, uh, an idea of ownership versus um, permissions. So ownership deals more with quotas. So we have a quota system based on, it's basically a total of CPUs, um, RAM, and disk capacity. Um, so like we have one cluster where you have 40 gigabytes of disk and um, I think four gigabytes of RAM or eight gigabytes of RAM and I can't remember how many CPUs. And you could provision things as you want. So if you want to do one gigantic VM, you can do that. Or if you want to do small little ones, you can do that. Um, so how the quotas are assigned are based on who owns the VM. And then you might have, so that group probably owns the VM and deals with the resources of that. Um, and then the users in the group can access that VM. Cool. And the intention was is that we have one cluster that we have where um, we want to manage how the VMs are, are deployed on this, this cluster because we don't want like a large this volume created on it. We have a very specific template on how we want these deployed. Um, and so we want to create the VMs, but we want to be able to give our users access to the console, when things break overnight, to reboot it and things and so forth. And then we have other projects that have their own Gnetic clusters, and we want to give them much flexibility to deploy things as they want. Um, and so we have that capability with Gnetic Manager. Uh, so moving on to Cinefo. Um, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. I think it's a Greek word for cloud, maybe? I don't remember. What does Gnetti stand for? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to ask Vito and some of the other devs sometime. I'm, I'm sure there's some, some name that it came from. I'm not sure. Um, so it has a lot of components that are kind of similar to OpenStack. Um, they have a compute networking image service layer, they have a file storage layer, a block storage layer, and then an identity service. Um, and basically it was a way of making Gnetti act more like a cloud service, because by itself it doesn't. It's pretty much a simple infrastructure as a service. Um, this probably gives you a better idea. <laughs> I'm using one of their, their slide images, uh, so I'll give them credit for this. But here is what a typical cloud stack, or open stack, uh, environment looks like. So you have KVM at the bottom for your hypervisor. You have libvirt to deal with the cluster in the node allocations. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, open site doing the cloud and the API and the UI. So if you want to see how Gennady fits in like an open site environment, it's this area right here basically. Um, it manages the node and the cluster. All this above is something you kind of have to add, which is what Cinefo does. Um, and so they have Cinefo here that does all the cloud provisioning in the back end. Um, they actually use some OpenStack API. So you you can actually, they actually have a nice little command line tool. So if you want to connect to Cinefo from the command line, you can do that. It's kind of like a bigger almost. Um, and then they have a UI in front of it as well. But it's intended to be a self-service as much. Um, the design, they built this system because they are uh, part of a research university. And they want to, they have a cluster of I think about 2,500 VMs. Um, and these researchers want to have access to build VMs to do what they want, um, and it seems to work really well for them. Um, kind of more of a cluster or an architecture point of view. Um, I love how the little assistant has a little smoking pipe. <laughs> 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 um, so Gennady, you have various Gennady clusters, and then they have um, there are other services that connect to it. So you have your Redox cluster over here, or Pegu talks between the two. Um, and then Pythos talks between Ambrogio, and uh, yeah. I haven't actually fully deployed this myself. Um, I'm probably gonna do it fairly soon. Um, but it's interesting, because you could actually use Gnetto Web Manager and Cinefo in the same system if you wanted to. So this is intended to be a self-service as a cloud, but you can have Gnetto Web Manager at least managing the Gnetto clusters themselves, so doing the, cl the cluster operations of like 
migrating instances that need to get migrated or um, needing to fix a node or take a node down or things like that. Um, there's quite a bit of, bit of things you can do with that. Um, it's an interesting architecture. Um, so as I said, you can do a lot of building on top of Gennady. Um, <clears throat> I think it's kind of one of those tools that you can do that with pretty easily. Um, you can augment it with a lot of various technologies. We're actually looking at possibly using GlusterFS. There's been a recent patch to KVM that significantly improves the I.O. of using GlusterFS for your, your disk images. Um, so I'm really kind of interested in that in some capacity. Um, but uh, it makes me really happy when I manage a Gennady cluster because I doing upgrades is pretty easy um, and so forth. So now I'm going to go through each of the components of both the various uh, cloud platforms to kind of see how they kind of compare. And these kind of all change. <laughs> I have a lot of little footnotes on here. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the storage. Um, they all basically do disk images, but in the case of Gennady, it really wasn't its first thing that it really was set up to do. Um, for a long time, you could do disk images, but you couldn't do, um, like say for example, you have an NFS, and maybe your NFS is actually HA, but you want to migrate between nodes. Gennady for a long time couldn't do that because it just understood it as being only on that one node. Um, and they recently added shared support for that now, so that works really well. Um, block devices, um, all of them basically do have support, but OpenStack for the first three, uh, that wasn't really their first intended. And if they do, it's more for the, the, the persistent storage, like EBS volumes. Um, in the case of Gennady, it was originally designed basically to use local storage, which for me I like because it offers a lot of speed. Um, uh, improvements if you really care about that. Um, fault tolerance, that was kind of a thing that I know when I first got into a lot of this, when I first got into Gennady, virtually nobody had fault tolerance built inside of the cloud system itself. Um, but they did, it was fairly simple. Um, and the thing about Gennady was is that was the very first thing they did. Um, that's the whole point of Gennady, is dealing with fault tolerance. But as time has progressed, they have some kind of uh, fault tolerance, even using the same technology that um, Gennady uses DRBD. But a lot of them now have some kind of a fault tolerance. You, got, you might not, you might have to enable by, because uh, it might not be there by default. What I don't understand is you want fault tolerance for all your data that you're storing, so why don't you just store your operational data in that exact same space, aside from the barest of configuration that you need to get into that space to begin with? Um, like, what do you mean exactly? So, for example, you have your fault tolerant DRBD uh, storage area, or you have some other storage area which is fault tolerant. Mm -hmm. Your system configuration file would say, this is how you get to the storage area that has my fault tolerant copy of my current state, my configuration, mm -hmm. everything, inside that storage area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you just store all your uh, consistency data inside of that storage area. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't that essentially what DRBD does? I'm not sure how that works uh, for that part specifically because it failed other things that I was looking at first. But <laughs> these systems that are actually using that as a storage area, why are they reinventing the wheel and not just using the full tolerant storage that they already have? Well, I know in the case of Gennady, it is. I mean, it, oh, it's, it's using the storage. It's you know the metadata is getting replicated to both servers for the on the on the storage part for DVD. and then in the case of the the configuration of the whole cluster that gets replicated to all the nodes that you want to become master capable. So if the master node goes down, you just force the cluster, another node to become the new master, and you can control it with that. Um, the other nice thing about Gennady is, is you can shut down Gennady and everything works fine. Um, the hypervisor is still running. Um, you just can't deploy anything, you can't control anything very easily. Um, but that was a nice thing. I know, especially when I did upgrades, um, I could shut down Gennady, do my upgrades, do some, some initial testing, start Gennady back up, and everything's working on the back end completely fine. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. I mean, you definitely need to follow a very specific step with how you upgrade Gennady. But they have a, uh, every time they upgrade the configuration file, they have a, they add parts into the config file. Uh, or, or the, they have a script called the config upgrader. So you stop Gennady on everything, you run the config upgrader, it'll modify the JSON file that has all the data, the, the cluster. And then you start everything back up, distribute the new config, um, I think you restart the daemons again, and then you run a verify command that basically does a sanity check that everything's fine. Um, and I've done that upgrade on a production cluster, which started on 2.00, 
and now it's at 2.52, um, and I haven't had a problem. I mean, I found a few weird things, but it didn't cause an outage, which was nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, the thing I like about that is because it doesn't have, it's not tied to like an SQL database for all its configuration, it's a flat file, which does have its performance hits. I do take that, um, but I digress. <laughs> Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't go into a lot of detail about Gnetic itself in this talk. Um, I have a whole different talk I can do some other time that I might maybe do next year. Because um, there's a lot of various components in it. Um, as far as the V and image comparison goes, um, Gnetic by itself fails horribly on this. Um, that's actually the part that I don't like about Gnetic um, that Senefo tries to fix, basically. Um, you know, OpenStack, Philippus, and Cloudstack do this really well. Um, you have the ability of users creating a VM. Say, I want to make a snapshot and use this again. Really easy to do with most of these other clusters. Gennady, not so much. Gennady has its own uh, system for dealing with images. It was originally designed on Debian for Debian. So the original way you installed VMs was using Dev Bootstrap. It literally would, uh, it's a set of bash scripts that would, uh, Gennady would say, here's your block device. Go do your, what you want. And you run fdisk, you run fdisk, partition it out how you want it, make fs it, run that bootstrap, install your basic Debian box, and there you go. Well, that's great if you want to use Debian or Ubuntu, but we use other operating systems. So I actually created my own uh, operating system deployment tool for Gennady called this image, which follows the premise of I want to make an image, and then I want to deploy it. And the problem is, is that it's not self-service, so a user can't go in, hey, I want to make a snapshot, let's go do it use this image again. So I basically create a base image that everybody uses, um, and then what, I have to constantly update those images every three months or so whenever a new software comes out, which is a no. But you can use a tarball, a disk image dump, or a raw file system image. Um, but it's worked for us. It's not the most ideal solution, but it works. So is there any comment, right? Say what? Do you have any functionality for copyright for images? Or not really, but if you use Netflix, you do. Um, I know Cinefo, that's one thing they did. They have a whole image service that does that. Okay. Um, and that's part of the, re the Redox stuff as well, I think. Okay. So it uses the, the DU plugging part of Redox, I think, for that as well. So that was, they fixed that problem for Gennady by building their own system that does it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have to admit, the VM image um, and deployment is kind of a weird thing in Gennady when you first get on it. Um, but I understand it fairly well, and it works OK. Um, if you use Linux-based distributions, it works pretty well. <laughs> as far as self-service comparison goes, um, OpenStack and Google's cost stack will do really well. Uh, obviously, Gennady by itself doesn't, but it can be augmented by a Web Manager and Cinefo if you, if you, if you need that. Uh, networking, again, a lot of these have very good, extensive networking options that you want. Huh? Maybe with floating FPs, huh? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I, I, it was kind of hard to talk about that one. Um, I think that might be able to be done with Cinefo, but I'm not sure. Um, it's probably a no. Um, but yeah, uh, the way networking works in Gennady by default is um, I create bridge interfaces on the VLANs that I want my VMs to live on, and then when I deploy a, 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 a VM, I say attach this bridge interface, and it attaches to it. Um, you can also do routed um, networking, but it doesn't do like automatic IP allocation, um, subnet uh, configuration, that sort of stuff. It doesn't do. However, they have been working on adding a feature for that um, in Gennady itself. Um, and that might actually, did it already make it in? Because I know Cinefo was using some of that in their version of Gennady. Um, well, if you aren't using static IPs, why aren't you using DHCP? Uh, in our case, it's because we have an arcane or old system. We do have DHCP, but our system is, we haven't had a chance to retool it. <laughs> but yeah, you can use DHCP. So if you have a separate system, an ICAM solution that does all the DHCP app management, then that's not a problem for Gennady, obviously. Um, you can use a hook to kind of deal with some of the various things. So as a VM goes through, you can say, I have this MAC address, go tell my ICAM solution I need an IP. They go does it, then the machine boots up and it's okay. Um, whatever you want to do. Um, but this is more talking about you wanting to set up private networks, that sort of thing. You can do that pretty easily with the other providers that's not really a part of uh, you know, but, uh, At least that's, like I said, that's my experience. Like A lot of them are better than worse than that. 
Um, so other factors, at least from a sysadmin point of view, what I consider is looking at their code base. You know, what is what is this their stack? Um, um, from what I understand, OpenStack is primarily Python. Um, Eucalyptus is kind of a mix of Java and C. CloudStack is Java. And then Gedetti is Python, Haskell, and a little bit of Shell. Um, <laughs> the Haskell is actually an accident. <laughs> when I talked to the, some of the developers. Um, it was one of those classic examples of, hey, we need to figure out how we do all allocation, and I just learned about Haskell. I wonder if I can do this in Haskell. <laughs> and they go do it, and they're like, crap, we need to rewrite this in Python, and they tried doing it, but they couldn't make it as elegant and as, as efficient as they did in Haskell. And <laughs> a long story short, um, they actually discovered that Haskell, having both Haskell and Python made a really interesting mix of languages to solve different types of problems. So they've actually been rewriting some of the core daemons optionally through and enable them in Haskell to fix some of the job locking issues they have. Because Gennady is all centered around job locking, job to be like starting a VM, creating a new VM, stopping a VM. Um, and there's a lot of uh, sanity checking so that jobs don't screw things up and do data uh, uh, interference, the data loss. So um, if you send it a lot of jobs, the Gennady system will turn slow and get things get bad. And so they're trying to fix that with Haskell. So that's kind of amusing. I think there's actually a white paper they did a few years ago. Um, so yeah, as far as hypervisor goes, and this probably is out of date because I think I saw your talk and you mentioned there was more on some of these. So just there's Oracle VM for version three of CloudStack, yeah. and there's LXC just came in a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So, uh, but depending on what type of hypervisor you want, kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, if you're still using VMware, you have a contract, you want to continue using them, you know, these three tend to have support for it. Um, Gennady doesn't, probably will never will, <laughs> um, unless somebody actually contributes a patch. Um, and they all kind of do the same kind of a thing. Um, the main thing point I wanted to make is that Gennady is kind of limited. It's primarily, it was originally written for Zen, they added KD later. LXC, I think it has most of the support, um, but it's not nearly as good as the Zen and KVM support. Um, I need to go back and look what they've done with uh, Linux containers because um, I want to start using that quite a bit. And the installation requirements, I really need to change the medium now because they keep adding more and more Haskell dependencies. <laughs> um, but yeah, and this has kind of uh, changed because before the installation requirements were more of a pain because you had to know what package to, to install, but now most of them have a, either uh, a package repository that has it actually has a package, so it pulls in all the dependencies, so it's not nearly as annoying um, as before. Um, so it kind of depends. I mean, disk space is cheap. It's more about your memory requirements on how the system is running, I guess. Um, but the thing that really bugs me is the maintenance. And I have to say, I didn't really get a chance to do like a full, here's how you upgrade on OpenStack. Here's how you do an upgrade on Eucalyptus. It wasn't just me looking at the system and like, how does this work? Um, I know the Gennady I've already mentioned is pretty easy on the upgrade part. Yeah. Um, as far as OpenStack, with all of its components, and from what I've heard from people I know, it seems like a nightmare. OpenStack, there are third-party distributions that make that a lot easier. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Piston and OpStack are good ones. Okay. But it's actually a design point right now not to have the upgrades. Like, like, yeah. I mean, it's... it's and it's like, for, re for reason, reasons that make sort of sense that that's why, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really didn't get a chance to fully understand how you can look at our cost type works with their upgrades. I think, I don't think they're nearly as bad as what OpenStack would be, but I'm assuming they have some kind of a process to kind of work through it. But I don't know. Maybe. It's not seamless to be for, I know that the hard part is because they're, they're all stateful VMs, so you've got to upgrade your databases or your database schema. Yeah changes and you have production systems. It's yeah. just hard, I mean, even, even the best of them, it's not seamless. It's yeah. If you have stuff running in production. Yeah, and I'm, I'm assuming pretty much you need to shut down your cluster to do the upgrade. Mm -hmm. Or do you, or can you mitigate some of that? With the open stack, the, the, the networking piece is the only thing that actually causes, you can shut down everything else piece by piece and bring it back up. The networking stack actually tears down the networking when it gets connected to that. Yeah. It'll be on which networking stack you're using. Okay. Yeah. There's there's 
in the main point is the network and stack doesn't have to get torn down to be upgraded outside of everything else. And yeah. so the only thing that really takes a hit when you do an upgrade is your API availability. Oh. The VMs stay running if, you, if you've got connection to the Okay, so it's the same thing like yeah. yeah. Yeah, is that the same way with Cloud Stack or how does the upgrade work? I, I actually haven't done enough personally. The the big problem for us is it's not really a problem, is is simply the history. The VMs would still be up and running because those mm -hmm. um, hosts would still be up and running, right. but um, there's this whole idea of history, and when you do that upgrade, that history, there's a break in that history. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know for me, when I was looking at these various platforms, that's, I'm a citizen, I like things to be simple, and I've just been really impressed with how easy it has been to do maintenance on GitHub from an upgrade. And so kind of getting into ease and installation. Um, so most of these have improved quite a bit over the years that I've mentioned. Um, OpenStack has been included in uh, Ubuntu, and now it's obviously been in more distributions. I probably need to update this slide from last time I did it. Um, the thing with OpenStack is that there's so much configuration you have to do that the only way I could test it really easily and quickly was finding a Puppet Labs module that do it all for me, just to get it something set up. There's obviously, I think there's been some tools out there that make it easier um, over time, but it definitely has a lot of, oh my gosh, what do I need to do with this config file and trying to figure out and understand everything. Why do I need this other service? Yeah, why do I need to have 10 services just to do this one thing? Um, yeah, as far as Eucalyptus goes, they have really improved their installation guide. They actually have Yum app repos. I love that. Um, and there's just a few commands to do the initialization, which is really sweet. Like I just ran a couple commands and I have a cluster. Now as far as like, does it work the way I want it? You know, that's obviously like it says that we kind of have to research it. Um, CloudStack provide their own repos too. I love it when projects do that. Also good installation guide, and there really wasn't that much I needed to do configuration wise. I was like, it started it up and it's all based in the GUI to change it. Um, Gennetti is included in Debian Ubuntu. Um, I'm actually trying to work on getting Gennetti into Fedora as a maintainer, I didn't find time. Uh, but there's some uh, community repos, like I think I have one that's a little outdated and a couple other guys have had like some DOS and RHEL repos, but it works. Um, and it works in Jitu too. <laughs> um, and the docs are pretty good, and it's really simple to initialize as a couple of commands, um, it's a couple of seconds, and it's good to go. Um, as far as our strengths and weaknesses, you know, I look at uh, OpenStack and I think, it's really young. Um, as far as like as a community, the code has probably been gone through a lot of changes over a while. Um, the or initial configuration is pain. Um, you know, there's a growing community. The corporate support has changed a lot over the years, so um, you know you kind of have to wonder about that. Um, Eucalyptus, I recall, has a lot of installation requirements, but it wasn't it was manageable. Um, you can configure it, but it's not as customizable. So if you want to tweak the system quite a bit, you kind of have to fit with what Eucalyptus has. Um, at first, they had the community inclusion problem because of the open core. I think they kind of fixed that. Um, you know, it does have some fairly decent fault tolerance capability in it, about commercial support. The hybrid cloud, if that's important to you, that's kind of one way to go. Um, I don't know, I'm not a hybrid cloud kind of guy. Um, cloud stack, I noticed that it's very GUI centric. It didn't seem like there's much you can do as far as configuration files. Me being a system, I don't like that. But if you have a lot of users, that's better. So. There is a, um, uh, a CLI called Cloud Monkey, so you can do it all manually. But the, the GUI centric is mainly there so that you can do multi tenant environments and delegate to the users. So okay. the, the, use, the GUI is just a reference um, implementation of the API. Mm -hmm. So everything is RESTful API capable, and then Cloud Monkey is the CLI that lets you mm -hmm. do it, you know. From a shell in the problem. And when I did my research, the AWS integration was claimed to be weak. I don't know if that's changed. Um, I felt that that wasn't really the goal of the cost stack to really do AWS compatibility. Um, maybe that's changed. So there's, and there is AWS compatibility in the um, API, but if I was really like sort of our mantra is, I, I'd prefer to delegate to like some of the cloud abstractions to like the JClouds are, mm -hmm. um, is sort of my favorite because it gives you not just the reference of um, the translation to cloud stack, but 
Amazon and like 30 other clouds. Right, right. So I think it's it's uh, the one that Eucalyptus, that's, that's like their calling card, but I think it's a lot of extra work for us yeah. that we don't want to do. Yeah, basically. Um, what I really thought when I worked on CloudStack, or yeah, CloudStack was the Google was really well rounded. It was really, really nice. Um, it, I thought the stack in general was fairly simple. It wasn't complicated like OpenStack. Um, it wasn't nearly. Uh, you mean Eucalyptus was a little had a little bit more components of CloudStack, but it seemed simple from just me looking at it from the outset. Um, and there's some customization you can do in the storage backend. So if you want to use SAM, if you want to use the storage, it seemed like it had a little bit. Um, going back to Gennetti, um, it's very app centric so if you're expecting a lot of users to use it, it may not be, um, I should say, like general users accessing it, it may not be the best tool. Um, and the VM deployment is annoying, there's no idea of the AWS integration, but the fault tolerance, if that's important to you, that's really awesome. It does N plus one redundancy built in, so if you try to deploy your VM and it thinks that you don't have N plus one redundancy, it won't let you do it unless you force it to. Uh, thanks. Um, really customizable, really customizable. You can see that from the Synefo architecture that they built. You can do a whole bunch of stuff with the hooks, um, the API, and so forth. And it's really simple to manage and maintain. Um, I know I was basically the only system in managing this because the students, you know, they're still learning about it. And I did it for many years, and it really wasn't that much overhead, which was awesome for me. Um, it worked really well. So I'm going to kind of go through this rather quickly since I only have five minutes left. Um, so which one do you want to use? It really depends on you, what you want to do, your size, what kind of services, your hardware, budget constraints, um, you know, how important is fault tolerance, um, is compatibility important, and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of factors to think about. Um, kind of going through the some of this, I mean, uh, I kind of view that uh, most of these are good for the, or the open stack, you can put some cloud stack is good for the large group of people. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, Systems, you know, get any good for like a small group of high trusted users. Um, so there's a lot of variation in there. Um, if you want to choose OpenStack, um, it's a young project, over backing, um, it's changing a lot. But I think long term, it has the potential of being really important to keep the ecosystem. I just think it's had a rocky road with all of its uh, changes in, in, in the community. Um, Eucalyptus, it's actually a pretty mature uh, project, has lots of features. Um, I've heard that it has pretty good commercial support, um, but it's definitely something to take a look at. Um, but it's a good hot cloud, hot hybrid cloud platform if that's important to you. Um, <coughs> CloudStack, when I say do distribution support, I mean they don't include it in the distribution, but they have their own repo, so that's not a problem. There's lots of features. Um, some, um, there, you do have fault tolerance built into it. Um, and I kind of looked at it, it seemed like it was a monolithic component architecture from when I looked at it. Um, but that can be good and bad. Um, and there was some recent ownership shifts, shifts that was actually like a year ago, but I think they're doing pretty good right now in Rockwell and Apache. Um, and actually this is used by several large hosting providers out there quite a bit, so it's, it's, it's used quite a bit. Um, as far as Gennady goes, well tolerance, um, I think it's really good for the smaller clusters, um, meaning you only have a couple of machines, maybe you only need to deploy a couple hundred VMs. Um, you can obviously do a lot more than that, um, you kind of have to configure it in a way to work, make it work a lot better. Um, use a local storage, which I like, better performance. Um, it really only solves the compute problem of the whole cloud ecosystem, um, but you can augment a lot of it with various other technologies if you know what you want. Um, you can try out Gennady. I have my own favorite testing. I know it's kind of inception, but it works. So if you want to try out uh, one to three node uh, system, um, I have various operating systems if you want to try it out. And then I have a walkthrough guide. So if you actually want to see what it's like to run a Gennady cluster, um, you can do that. Uh, it's pretty cool. I think it's working. We built this so that our development team can have a way of uh, uh, trying running Gennady on their own systems. Um, but it works. Um, and then why didn't they include the others? Well, they all kind of have different, uh, either different focus. So like Open Nebula is very high performance computing. Uh, Nimbus seems, I didn't really, haven't heard much about them. Um, and then Over is like its own set of, its own thing. Um, I think it's a great project, but it's kind of in a class of its own um, in its way. Um, so in the end, there's no real winner or loser in my, my regard. It kind of depends on what you need. Um, you know, each of them may work 
better or worse for you. Um, the only thing I say is try out each platform, try to walk through all the steps, kind of map out what you want to do, um, and think about scalability, manageability, and thought tolerance, and kind of see what you need to do. Um, and then my classic side at the end, <laughs> I made it through in 15 minutes. Um, do you have any questions? I know I went through a whole bunch of information. Um, how about remoting protocols for any type of desktop? like access? I know everything's for server virtualization, but is, are there any third-party projects for Gennetti that might make it somewhat usable for desktop virtualization? You mean doing like thin client type stuff with it, or are you talking like running Gennetti on it? Well, let's say like using the SPICE protocol. They've for, added, yeah, they do have SPICE protocol support. I know they've added that. Um, and they've added support so that you can add, basically send arbitrary KVM commands. Um, at your own risk, but the intention was, I have this PCI card or whatever that I have this hardware on that I need to do, need to have a VM running. So, um, yes, I think so. I haven't heard many people that have done that, but I think it definitely can do that. It has the capability of doing that. Okay, thank you. And I, and I, and I kind of got the impression that Google kind of does that internally, but they're kind of hush-hush on how they actually use it any much internally. So you could add uh, a command to that then if it doesn't directly support uh, configuring KVM for the discard uh, pass-through, that you could add your own command into it and it would just work then because it's modifying the existing storage parameter. Well, what I mean is um, before you were limited by what KVM flags you can change on Gennetti based on what was actually in Gennetti. I think in an upcoming version they've changed it so that Basically, whatever you can do on the command line, you can just tell Gennady, add this flag to the argument right. of the KVM. So if you have some special flag that you want to have enabled on your KVM image, you can do that. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Because um, they finally were like, yes, we'll do that. But obviously, if it doesn't work with migrations, um, then you know if you want to do a live migration, then that may break the VM. But you can always shut down and fail it over to another instance pretty easily. Has to be used at your own risk. Exactly, exactly. As all as are most things. <laughs> um, if you want to learn more about Gennetti itself, I have a lot of slides on my website from uh, previous uh, talks. I don't know if I have any videos or audio, but I probably do somewhere. I should probably comb the internet and find them. Um, but um, like I said, I didn't do it the best job of explaining how Gennetti itself works from a technical point of view. Um, but uh, I do have that information out there. Um, I didn't feel like I wanted to spend all the time just talking about Gennetti and how I'm comparing it to other platforms in there. But hopefully I've given you enough ideas at least to understand how Gennetti works. One other thing, Debian releases a week from now, uh, Debian 7, so the okay, version of that that lasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think actually the Gennetti uh, developers are Debian developers. So they contribute back to the community as far as the package goes. Cool. Well, if there's no uh, other questions, you, you can find me here in the conference for the rest of the day. You know how to find me here in the other questions.